Jamie Jones. It is co-innovations. Jamie, are you ready? Yes, I'll be sharing my screen, I presume. Can yes. everybody see that? Yes, we can see it. All right. We'll look for I'll start the timer whenever you're ready. All right. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for allowing us at Cove Innovations to present today at the startup presentations. We are a therapeutic and research company mainly focused today on solving a problem that's desperate in, in the last three or four years, of course, COVID. So I'll get right into it and set, excuse me, and set, hmm, having the problems here. There is an unmet need. It might not be as obvious because we hear a lot about vaccines that we hear about early COVID disease, but there is an unmet need where there is no effective treatment to cure the sickest ICU patients with late stage COVID or severe COVID. Dexamethasone is being used right now. It's the best available option. Of course, the, the, the treatments that have been indicated for early or mild to moderate treatment are being thrown because US physicians, you have to use what you have, but yet not indicated, not effective. And there are no, there are no FDA approved treatments in the, in the near term for late stage or severe COVID-19. This is a top 10 list no country wants to be on. This is as of today. Newly reported deaths the last seven days. Now, while treatments to this point of vaccines have done a remarkable job taking this number from the high 60,000s a year ago down to 15, about down about 75%, there are still in any given seven days, 15,000 people dying globally. Almost 3,000 people in the United States have died in the last seven days. There is a large unmet need to serve these patients to get hospitalized with late stage COVID. So the problem really is COVID's lethal trigger. We, most of us probably know that, right? It's that rapid viral spread, the overactive immune response or that cytokine syndrome, that cytokine storm that unfortunately causes premature death. This premature death that as of 2020 numbers say has caused just in the United States alone $4 trillion to the healthcare system of $16 trillion that COVID has caused in the healthcare system. Two things are needed to be able to solve this problem easily, not to oversimplify, but the reduction of circulating viral load and also the modulation of inflammation. At COVID Innovations, we believe that we have found this solution COVID-001, which is an oral fixed dose combination therapy for severe COVID-19. Mechanism of action is, the immune, is an immune system modulator. It has both anti-inflammatory and antiviral activity with low side effects and significant clinical efficacy when added right now to the standard of the care, and that would be DEXA as we know today. So in our proof of concept, a retrospective chart group done back in 2020, 121 patients were hospitalized with COVID-19 induced oxygen hunger. Of those 121, 77 patients were on one of the two APIs that are in the fixed dose combination for COVID-001. The results were a 68% reduction in mortality, a 37% reduction in the length of hospital stay, which, which was the equivalent of about six days saved in the hospital, with a 93.5 survival rate. Now, this was the impetus for us to look for a second active pharmaceutical ingredient that could solve for the six and a half percent of the patients that expired during that retrospective review. And we have found that. And that has what has spawned us onto our drug development program and our three programs that we have currently in the pipeline. Our gateway COVID-19 indication we just spoke about. Our program two is our long COVID program, which will start in later, end of 2023, beginning of 2024. And after our pre-IMD meetings with the FDA and BARDA, we, were, we learned from BARDA that there are biological weapons that also trigger the same type of cytokine storm and an overactive immune response in, with biological weapons. So we will be beginning a biodefense antidote program as well and in our conversations with BARDA, there seems to be interest in, in funding our phase three studies. We're confident about our unpublished data. We have the only human data using 
both the, both the APIs in combination and a fixed dose combination in COVID-19 patients. This would give us first to market advantage. Our IP estate, we've been building it since 2021, has become stronger and stronger with nine provisional utility patent applications, one U.S. utility application, as well as two international patent cooperation treaty applications. And we continue to build on that to build into the value of the company. The market is interesting because the numbers, quite frankly, are all over the place. All countries don't report the same way. We can only depend on certain things. But when we look at a very conservative estimate and looking at strictly uh, as a marketplace, we think the total addressable market is about $20 billion annually, while a serviceable, what we can get to maybe is about $10 billion. What we think that we can obtain is an annual revenue of $3 billion in the next four years. Or I should say five years, excuse me, 2027. And when you look at the total market, and remember in 2018, there was no COVID market, there was no vaccine market, there were no treatment market for obvious reasons. In 2022, the market alone is trending for $35 billion in annual revenue. And with a 10% compound annual growth rate out to 2030, it'll easily be a $70 billion therapeutic market. That's a therapeutic market, not including vaccines. Currently, what's out in the market right now, you well know, Paxlovid, which is the lead horse in, in the race, trending towards $22 billion in sales this year at a, at a cost of therapy at $529. Then Merck, then Gilead, we all remember Remdesivir, which was the great hope at first. Some say Remdesivir is limping in at an annual revenue of $5 billion. And recently, what, just in May of this year, Eli Lilly's drug... Which, will, which is trending right now for $2.2 billion. Now, you can see the difference in cost. Of course, Pfizer and Merck being oral, Gilead and Lilly being IV, and there's COVID innovations. Now, this 22 annual revenue, there's a note. This would be our first full calendar year of revenue, which we predict is going to be 2024, will come in at anywhere between $1.5 and $1.9 billion at a $500 course of therapy uh, price. And we believe this is a very approachable price and a very fair price. And we're able to give this price because we'll have price protections within our manufacturing and within our technology because we are using two APIs that have been in existence for a long time as, as generics, but put together in a fixed dose combination, we'll have five years of marketing exclusivity. And we believe that our uh, other programs that will use the, that fixed dose combination in some way, shape, or form will also give us continued market exclusivity, as well as the patents, of course, that we'll have for the next 19 to 20 years. So looking at the revenue, as I said, in 2024, we'll probably be at a $1.9 billion and then slowly and gradually move up in 2027, where we think we'll be at a threshold of about $3.1 or $3.2 billion. We're in a, and we're in the first quarter of a Series A raise for $25 million. Of course, most of that expense going to clinical trials, about $15 million, and drug development at about $6.5 million. The interesting thing about this Series A is we believe with this $25 million raise in a Series A, we won't need any other outside fundraising, and we'll be able to secure funds from our realizable revenue, which we believe we can start having at second half of 2023 at the earliest. Now that depends on a few things, of course. That depends on our drug development process, but what it really depends on is the conversations that we've had with the FDA so far and their positive note around what we'd be able to file for EUA if the information comes out. We think we have a good chance, as good a chance as you can think you can have in drug development with an early use authorization, that's what we will file immediately once we file our IND, which we plan on filing our IND within the next six months. So at COVID Innovations, our leadership team, it is, it is lean and it is lean for a reason. We plan on being what is called a virtual pharmaceutical company. You've probably heard of that, where we have a tight leadership team, management team, and a board, and we will contract out key services, whether it be distribution, manu manufacturing, even field organizations to keep our costs. We believe we can cut back from 30 to 35% of our, on our overall costs rather than being brick and mortar. And our board, our board has over a hundred years either in life science, clinical practice or technology and in international trade and in exportation. 
So we have a very experienced board who have either been CEOs at life science companies, hedge fund CEOs, or running multinational and multi-billion dollar exportation companies. One minute to go, Jamie. Thank you. And that was perfect timing because if you would like to contact me, of course, I'll put my information in uh, the chat, but I'm Jamie Jones, I'm the CEO. And thank you for coming to our presentation today about COVID innovations and questions, of course. All right, uh, let's see, Wins, go ahead. You take the first shot. So Jamie, a uh, very good presentation. I have two perspectives. Recently, about like six days ago, uh, they came up with a, a COVID solution, which was discovered 100 years ago to cure tuberculosis. That's one perspective. And other perspective is that a lot of vaccines were made in 2021 within nine months. And that was because of the research and a lot of time spent in the last 250 years. So how are you positioned in future? Well, I think I mentioned that the two APIs are generic drugs at the time. There are millions of patient day lives on those drugs and actually hundreds of thousands of patient day lives on the combination of the two inadvertently. Um, and that's interesting that you mentioned that, but CTAP has been one of the reasons why there's been this truncation of the development program. And we see across all phases that it's up to one sixth or one seventh of the time where it might take 30 to 32 months to get through a phase and treatment is actually taking a month less than it is in vaccinations. So I think the other thing there is vaccines are fine. Vaccines are great. They work when they're taking, but they're not the panacea. And right now, I think the, the number today is around 23% of adults in the United States, just using the United States as an example, have been vaccinated. That's still, what, 77% of the people out there. And obviously, because of the running seven-day death rate, unfortunately, being above 15,000, there are still a lot of patients in, being hospitalized and being hospitalized in need of oxygen supplementation. Matter of fact, at any given day in the United States, there are 40,000 people hospitalized with COVID and globally it's over 200,000. So there is a need for it. And I can't speak to the drug that was just discovered because you're, you're telling me something new there. I, I, that's news to me, I will look that up. What I can say is the interesting thing about vaccines is that of course, I know we probably all heard of Novavax, and over the last two weeks, at least in the stock market, what happened with them because they had to claw back on their forecast by over, I think, maybe a billion and a half dollars because we're experiencing vaccine fatigue. And because you live it every day, that we live in a healthcare society that is chronic care based, not preventative care based. Unfortunately, there's always going to be a need for treatment for myriad of diseases, not COVID alone. Yes, preventative. Then you're absolutely right. Now, again, everything is evolving. This tuberculosis thing, which was there for 100 plus years, was just discovered six days ago. That's the new to the whole. But we'll talk offline on this. Definitely. Okay, uh, Dana. Any questions? Um, this is a really interesting. The one thing, that one question I have is really how you're managing the low cost comparing to everybody else's out there. What's your secret sauce there? <laughs> well, the secret sauce there, and that's a great question. And the secret sauce there is we could charge as much as Gilead, my former company, charges for remdesivir. We could charge as much as Lilly does for their drug. Because, because of the acquisition cost of the APIs, we believe we'll be running at an operating margin of above 85% for the next five years. That gives us an, a, an immense amount of wiggle room in our price. So we can go one or two ways with it. We can go to try to gouge the market and just look at making billions and billions of dollars or even hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's say we shoot for the stars and land on the moon, right? But is that what's right for the system? Is that what's right for patients? Because at the end of the day, if our drug would have been out, in 2021, we would have saved probably 323,000 lives by our, our calculations. So, you know, we're not in, as all of us on this conference are not in this for the money. It's good to make a great living. But at the end of the day, we're here to impact patient lives and save lives. And if we can be a part of that at Code Innovations, that's what we'll do. Thank you. 
Yeah, I really enjoy that sentiment, Jamie. We're here to make it better for all the patients all around the world. Thank you for that. I'm just curious about, um, with my biology background, what is the exact mechanism of action of this medication? Well, they are two AG agonists. And if I was had your clinical background, I could pronounce the AG, what that AG is, but I can't. So that's why I call it a two AG agonist. Um, and, and, and that is what targets the cytokine storm and is able to arrest it. It basically, it turns off that cytokine storm switch. And who would own the patent on? Well, we would own the patent on the fixed dose combination. Because the two APIs are metabolized through the same pathway, it would be very, for lack of a better word, it would be very dangerous to try to take both of those drugs. You could say, well, Jamie, why wouldn't they just go out there and buy the generics once they find out what they are? Well, unfortunately, if they did that, they probably would be having a lot of trips to the emergency room, and unfortunately, some may expire. So that fixed dose combination, and I came from a company that is very good at fixed dose combinations. Everybody knows they're very good at virology, but what Gilead Science was, is very good at over 35 years is putting two, three, or four drugs in a pill that you can actually swallow and it'd be effective. So that fixed dose combination technology, as well as the patents on that, we will own. Okay. And then one last question from my side, from a patient perspective. Uh, for a patient who does not have insurance, how much do you think they have to pay for it, for the treatment? Oh, well, that's a good question, because right now you probably heard in the news that the government said that they're not buying any more vaccines or treatments by the end of the year. I think we probably have to wait for that to see when the next wave comes back. Hopefully, hopefully, the depending on what they're, or if you're saying with no health care insurance, it would be, if, they're not, if, if, if they're treated for a 10-day course of therapy, it would be $500. Now, of course, we all know what hospital stays cost. And in our and, and in our calculations, we calculated the average hospitals be about what twenty five thousand dollars a day. So it's 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 treatment wise, just for the therapeutic option, they shouldn't have to come out of their pocket for a ten day course of therapy. In today's calculations, five hundred dollars. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the time for us. So go ahead and uh, score. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. It was a great question. Thank you.